Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Petit, and I will be giving a talk titled Integrating Staphopia into Staphylococcus aureus Genomic Investigations. In this talk, I will introduce you to Staphopia and hopefully by the end, give you an idea on how you might be able to use Staphopia in your own studies. So let's get started. First, let me introduce genomic epidemiology. Genomic epi uses whole genome sequencing for surveillance, outbreak investigations, and retrospective studies. And I think a clear example of how powerful genomic epidemiology can be is SARS-CoV-2. To date, more than 400,000 genomes have been sequenced. People around the globe are working together and they are standardized in the process for data collection and analysis. Because of this, you can take a sequence and use genomic epi to rapidly compare it to samples across the world and ask, has this sequence been seen before? Is it a new introduction? Among many other questions. But did you know that Staph aureus has more than 70,000 whole genome sequencing samples that are publicly available? Wouldn't it be nice to use them? Well, it's not that simple. Let me explain why. Imagine you're at the only library in town looking for a sci-fi book. You go up to a librarian who happens to be a gloomy robot named Marvin and ask, where's the sci-fi section? Marvin unwillingly shows you to the sci-fi section. It's just a bunch of books with blank covers. A bit disappointed, you ask, well, do you have life, the universe and everything? Marvin joyously says, maybe, but you'll have to find it yourself. So you begin your search by opening your first book and you continue opening many, many books. You still haven't found your book. You finally reach your breaking point and ask yourself, can't I just curate the section myself? While it's no small feat, you are a part of a sci-fi book club. So you invite the book club to come help curate the sci-fi section. Collectively, the group goes through the contents of each book to create a much more descriptive book cover. So what's the difference between these? Well, the first is just a bunch of books with blank covers that offer no details about the contents. And to find something specific, you have to open up and read every book. Whereas the second, when you create the books, you give them a much more descriptive book cover where that gives details like title, author, and summary. By adding the descriptive book covers to the sci-fi section at the only library in town, you can now better utilize this, this section of the library. And to not leave you with a cliffhanger, you do eventually find the book you were looking for. Now keep those imagination hats on just a little bit longer. But for some of you, you know this next bit to be a reality. So now imagine you want to use Steph Aureus genomes from the sequence read archive. You were probably hoping for descriptive book covers process sequences so you can pick up the results you want, collected metadata so you know all about the samples, known genomic context so you know about antibody resistance or virulence genes, and it's possible to screen so you can just select the genomes you want that fit your study. But instead, the library in town has blank book covers. You get raw unprocessed sequences, only as much metadata as the submitter provides, you know nothing about the actual sequences, and you cannot reliably select samples that fit your study. So in order to effectively use the only library in town, you have to look at every genome. But why is that the case? Why don't you get the descriptive book covers? Well, they solve two different problems. The first is the sequence read archive, which shows whole genome sequencing for thousands of species. And it's a critical resource for genomics for archiving and maintaining re reproducibility. Whereas the curated section has taken a section of SRA, say one particular species, and applied species specific knowledge to it. And in doing so, it made this one small section of the SRA, again, the only town and the only library in town, much easier to use. So how do we get descriptive book covers for Staph aureus? Well, you probably guessed it, but the Staph aureus club has to curate it. So we built Staphopia. 
Staphopia includes an analysis pipeline that takes genomes from the SRA and processes them. Staphopia cleans and standardizes raw sequences. It assembles and annotates, determines MLST type, predicts antibiotic resistance and virulence, and calls variants against Staph aureus N315. Staphopia also includes extensive effort to extract metadata from publications. Uh, Staphopia includes the results for more than 40,000 genomes and is free and publicly available. More than 75% of these genomes are high quality, 65% are predicted to be MRSA, and 1,000 unique sequence types are represented. Even better, Staphopia offers programmatic access to all the data. To demonstrate how Staphopia can be used, I would like to present a small case study regarding quack a mediated chlorhexidine resistance. Chlorhexidine is a biocide used for Staph aureus decolonization. And the quack a gene is usually plasmid borne and encodes a multi-drug efflux pump associated with chlorhexidine resistance. Using the data available in Staphopia, we can ask questions like, is quack a enriched in methicillin resistant strains? And if present, how long has quack a been in the Staph aureus population? To answer the first question, we can search for quack a in all 40,000 genomes and use the presence of MEC a as evidence for being methicillin resistant. In this chart, we see most of the genomes in Staphopia do not have evidence for Staph aureus or for quack a. But in those that do, the genomes are mostly predicted to be methicillin resistant. So it does appear that quack a is enriched in methicillin resistant strains. Now we can also, to answer the second question, we can use available metadata such as collection date to see how long quack a has been in the population. And based on the available metadata, it appears there's evidence for quack a having been present for many years. But I think the important takeaway from this case study is using Staphopia, we were able to ask an interesting question and quickly get preliminary results that would have been that would, have, that would not have been possible using the SRA directly. Now, how can you use Staphopia? Well, let's say you go to Staphopia and ask, hey, Staphopia, can I please have a genome that looks like this, uh, this orange book looking genome? Staphopia would begin searching and a very short time later, bring you a list of samples that match your request. And these are all denoted by the little stars. Now, what if, what if you aren't quite sure what you needed, but wanted a good representation of the staff population and didn't want to use all 40,000 genomes? Do you have to use all 40,000 genomes? And the answer is no. We created the non-redundant diversity data set, or as I like to call it, the nerd set. The nerd set is made up of 380 genomes, all being high quality, linked to a publication, and each representing a unique sequence type. Using the nerd set allows you to overcome sample bias that's present in Staphopia because 60% of the publicly available genomes are represented by only 10 sequence types. The, these 10 most common sequence types are circled in the tree. So you can see that the nerd set includes diversity that would have likely been missed had you just taken a random subsample of the genomes present in Staphopia. Now, how have other studies used Staphopia? They've used Staphopia to rationally subsample public genomes, for example, selecting only those genomes that are in a particular sequence type. Uh, they've used uh, Staphopia to search a specific uh, genomic signature, such as a mutation, uh, against all public genomes. And it's been used uh, for sec secondary tools such as what's new. So what's next for Staphopia? Well, a lot has changed, so Staphopia is due for an upgrade. Version two. And the next version of Staphopia, I will, I will reprocess all publicly available Staph aureus genomes using Bactopia, which is based off of Staphopia's original analysis pipeline, but includes updated methods and works on other organisms. Good news though, this is done. Uh, I completed this already using Amazon Web Services and wrote about it in a blog post. So if you're interested to read 
how I process 60, 67,000 genomes in five days, uh, go give it a read. Uh, I would also like to repackage Staphopia as a pre-configured Bactopia instance to include staph-specific analyses. Uh, this has started with the creation of Staph aureus-specific data sets that includes virulence factors and uh, resistance genes, including SPA and SSC MEC. Uh, finally, I would like to improve the API usability so that users can take their own data and create a local Staphopia instance which consists of only the public genomes that they want to include in their, their study. So let's wrap it up. The SRA is an amazing resource for genomics, but due to its function, it can only provide genomes with blank covers. And I'm not complaining because as long as the SRA is up, Staphopia and whatever comes next can be recreated. Uh, Staphopia takes the Staph aureus genomes in SRA and it applies a descriptive book cover Staphopia can be used in many ways, such as exploratory analyses or to screen samples from the SRA uh, and include them in your own investigations. Finally, st uh, Staphopia version two is in the works and coming together quite nicely. So hopefully it'll be available soon. Uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone for listening. Uh, I would also like to extend a huge thanks to the many scientists and funders behind the publicly available genomes, uh, the DDBJ, ENA, and SRA for storing and organizing the public data, and all the developers of software and databases used by Staphopia, because without all these, Staphopia doesn't exist. Um, I would like to thank the emergent group here at Emory and also the funders, Emory, NIH, Georgia EIP, and AWS. Again, big thank you to everyone and thanks again for listening. Bye.